Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mike Noble, and I will be the host for this TLC session, Renew Your Instructor Mindset and Recondition Your Instructional Engagement Toolbox by Debbie Halewood and Julie Nidefer. We're excited that you have joined us today to hear Debbie and Julie's presentation. The chat window will be open during the session, so please feel free to participate or ask questions. Please welcome Julie and Debbie. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, I see there's a pretty good amount of people in the room. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I just going to preface this with I apologize if I can't keep eye contact because I have two screens and our presentations is on this one. So I'm just going to preface it with that one. Um, I'm Debbie Hillwood. I am lead faculty for EXP 105. And I want to pose a question to you all. I want to see, Julie, I'm realizing I don't have control of our <laughs> our presentation. I wanted to see if in the chat you can define the word engagement. There we go. Thanks. So in the chat, just go ahead, take a few moments. What does the word engagement look like to you? Okay, so Jeff says meaningful, authentic interaction between two more people. Ramona says continuous connection, contact. I like the alliteration there, but that adds extra credit for alliteration. Making meaningful connection, active involvement in the activity in which you're taking part, interacting meaningfully. <laughs> Connie said, I'm sorry, Wendy says interacting meaningfully. Anyone else? Communication between a sender receiver with constant feedback between both parties. Connecting to a cognitive and emotional level. Oh, I like that one, Wendy. On a cognitive and emotional level. Sherry says, I have a whole announcement, announcement on how to engage with course material and then with each other. Interaction in a proactive manner. Awesome. Okay, those were really great um, definitions that everyone shared when they thought or hear or think about the term engagement. So as we go through this presentation, we just wanted to establish and talk about the fact that language is our operating system. It's our foundation for communication and it's what allows us to collaboratively work toward common goals. However, it's so easy for us to overlook the importance of establishing a common language because we tend to utilize words that come from what we would consider to be a common vocabulary. So we take for granted that everyone is on the same page when we're talking about those things. Um, so as, as we think about that language being our common operating system, what does that look like in the classroom? If our idea is one thing and we don't establish that common idea with our students, are we setting them up for success or how does that transfer in the classroom? And then the second component to that is language as our operating system is happens at the university level when we established that common language. You know, do we all speak the same language? Here, our categories for the instructional quality review are critical thinking, instructive feedback, high expectations, establishing relationships and instructor expertise. And we take for granted that those are very common um, phrases and terms and concepts in, you know, the education world of education. But for those of you who work at universities, teach in several places, it might take on a little bit of a different twist. You know, does critical thinking look the same in the Ashford classroom as it does someplace else that you've taught with instructive feedback? So again, just making sure that we all are on the same page that we speak that same language because once we've established that common language it's much easier to make sure that we're meeting our goals so 
sorry, I have to unmute here. So that comes uh, brings us to our kind of central thesis of this particular presentation and what is what instructional approaches and strategies can help us develop these quality measures, right? These these um, uh, common quality measures that we see on the in instructor uh, quality review. Um, and let's see here, do I have, sorry, Julia, you're gonna have to do all the clicking all right. for me, thanks. <laughs> so for, for this pr particular presentation, there's a lot of different um, strategies, there's a lot of different approaches that we can use. For this particular presentation, we, um, we uh, chose to focus on four different areas. We chose to focus on mindset, uh, validation theory, um, emotional intelligence and culturally responsive in, in instruction. And so uh, we're going to speak a little bit more to that uh, throughout this presentation. Oops. So as we go through um, each of those four instructional practices or strategies, as we talk about them, we're going to pose a series of reflective questions. You might want to grab a sheet of paper, jot it down. At some point, we'll ask you to share in the chat, but privately, we do want you thinking about these answers um, as, as you go through. So make a commitment and, and write down something. It'll be more meaningful as we go throughout the rest of the presentation. So our first question is, what do I, in my professional role, believe in my core about students' capacity to learn. So what do I believe in my core about students' capacity to learn? So I'm gonna give you a few 30 seconds to jot down your thinking on a separate sheet of paper or notes on your, on your computer, open up a document. I know for those of us who participate in lots of things like this, it's natural to want to share right away, but we just want you thinking some private think time first. So hopefully I've given you enough time to come up with a statement that reflects how you feel in your core, what you believe about your students' capacity to learn. And as we talk about that comes from mindset. Um, Carol Dweck introduced you know, the concept of mindset or beliefs about your most basic qualities. Um, she brought to us the idea of a growth in a fixed mindset and showed us through decades of research that helping students develop a growth mindset can really motivate, motivate them um, to be more productive in education and business and in sports. So that's, you know, why it's important in the classroom that we're cognizant of that mindset, a growth in a fixed where our students are at. Introducing mindset pr promotes self-insight. It changes the meaning of effort and it changes the meaning of failure. So as we're working with, with students, um, we want to emphasize the importance of effort. It's not the end product, it's the pathway all along. Um, and we also want to make sure that they understand that failure is not defeat, um, it's a stepping stone. And so application in the classroom, it's an opportunity for us to let students know that failure is an opportunity. It's our first attempt in learning. It's not a final attempt in learning. Um, it builds, we can build in constant and opportunities for self-reflection through mindset as we introduce that, as instructors identify students um, in the classroom making fixed mindset statements. We can challenge those fixed mindset statements and help them work through that, look at it a little bit differently. It promotes a self-awareness when you're aware of your mindset is or why you're thinking your attitude towards a certain thing and sometimes just being cognizant of that can pull you out. It allows us to value the process equally as much as the product. So again, slowing down and appreciating what goes on along the way. And, um, and a final thing whenever possible is to offer students choice when they can choose their path to demonstrate mastery. We find that there's a greater chance of perseverance. They're gonna be more willing to put forth the effort and continue. So on our next slide, as we look at an opportunity to self-reflect in fostering an educator mindset, um, so often now we're, we're, we're pretty schooled in mindset. Most of us are comfortable integrating those concepts in the classroom. And so we 
are really good at helping our students recognize where their mindset lies and how they can overcome that. But how often do we self reflect on what is our instructor mindset in terms of our students capacity to learn and perform and do well. And so I have an example here of a fixed, you know, in a growth mindset statement with that performance and a belief might be from a fixed mindset students, some students don't have the capacity to learn and achieve in a particular subject area, regardless of effort. And that might sound like from an instructor, every assignment I get from Robin shows she is not capable of thinking critically about the text. I've tried everything. There's nothing else I can do. And what that looks like from an instructor standpoint is this instructor might avoid changing instruction. They exert minimal effort in trying to help the student succeed. They interpret constructive feedback on their own instruction as a personal attack. And they might downplay or discredit the success that others have as they in implement different strategies. On the other hand, a growth mindset statement might look like every student has the capacity to learn and achieve in all subject areas. Ability is unlimited with effort and practice. And so that tweak of that growth mindset statement might sound like every assignment I get from Robin shows that she isn't able to think critically about the text yet. I'm ready to try something different to see if it might help. So putting ownership again in the instructor to help the student walk through that. A growth mindset instructor is probably eager to teach all students. They'll persist with unrelenting effort to help all. They invite in constructive feedback and are inspired by other teachers' success. So as you look at that, in the last category is where your statement would go. So that original statement that you wrote about your what you believe in your core about a student's capacity to learn would be your belief. So if you put that into that category did your statement reflect a fixed or a growth mindset what might that sound like when you're talking about a student and what might that look like um, in terms of your instructional practice in the classroom and interact in, and interaction with colleagues so thinking thinking about those those things in your instructor mindset Okay, so shifting gears here, here's another question for you to reflect on. Again, as Julie mentioned, let's just um, quietly reflect. You don't have to share this, this one in the chat. It's more for your own um, thoughts. Um, how do my words and actions contribute to my students' belief that they belong here? So how do my words and my actions contribute to my students' belief that they belong here. So I'm gonna embrace the awkward silence for about 30 seconds or so for you to just kind of reflect on that. So um, Laura Rendon uh, did some research on uh, first generation students as well as what we refer to as non-traditional students. So students who are coming back to school at a, an age that is not 18 to 22-ish. Um, and she did a lot of research, um, particularly in the community college setting, but she, she did a lot of research on these students who have these insecurities um, uh, and uh, she found that some of the most important things um, about validating these students' beliefs in their belonging to be in college and to be learning at this, at this um, point in their life is it really reflects, it really falls, I should say, this responsibility on the institution. So agents of the institution. So um, obviously faculty members in the classroom, but also other individuals, uh, student affairs and academic affairs, um, um, uh, staff members. Um, uh, it falls on everyone who has contact with students in the college setting. And it's, it's our responsibility to provide these validating experiences for the students and to remind them like you, you do belong here. You, you, you can succeed when you're here. And so um, 
Julie and I both realize we've broken all the rules of, of PowerPoint presentations with this particular presentation. We have lots of words and lots of bullet points, but hopefully you'll take some time to, to refer back to this, or if you're watching this in the recording, you'll, you'll press pause and you'll take a, a chance to, to read through this, but we'll highlight a few of the key ones here. Um, so I mentioned the very first bullet point, but we want to make sure that we are confirming the students' um, capacities and abilities. This sounds a lot like uh, fixed my, or a growth mindset, right? Um, and it's a lot of these theories, they, they overlap with each other. Um, but it is our responsibility to, to take on the, 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 the purpose of validating our students. And so we have some application in the classroom right here. Um, that could look like just expressing a genuine concern for our students. So if they don't show up one week, we could ask them, hey, what's going on? You know, is everything all right? Reaching out to them and not waiting for them to come to us getting to know the students by their preferred name. Do we ask them, what is your preferred nickname? Uh, I, my name is Deborah, but I prefer to go by Debbie. I know when people don't really care to get to know me if they keep referring me as Deborah. Um, my name is Debbie. And um, be personal, be approachable, be partners in their learning, ask them questions about themselves, genuinely get to know them, create opportunities for them to learn or to try, them, try again or see themselves as capable. Um, provide meaningful feedback and of course maintaining high expectations. If we drop those expectations, that's going to validate to the students that we don't believe that they belong here and that we think that they can only meet this very low bar. So we need to keep the bar up here and then encourage them and validate that they can get there. Oops, there we go. Um, and then how might, uh, some, some questions that we pose to you. So we've already given you one, but here's a few more that align with this particular aspect of validation. So how might my words be alienating my students or making them fearful? So um, shout out to one of our uh, enrollment managers out there. Julie and I were in a, a, a uh, training one time and he asked everybody in the room, all the employee, uh, the enrollment employees, do you ever find yourself asking and saying to the student, don't worry, this is easy. You've got this. It's not a problem. It'll be a piece of cake. Well, how is that? What is that communicating to those students who are not finding this easy? Right? Is that, that makes them feel as though, you know what, I, I just, if this is supposed to be easy and I'm having a hard time with it, then obviously I don't belong here. So we need to be careful too about the messages that we're saying. We feel like we're encouraging but we also have to make sure that we're, we're providing those, those messages that, are, that aren't alienating the students who are already walking in here with, with a level of fear. Um, what do I do to show my students that I value who they are and what they bring to the classroom? Um, how do I promote an environment where students have opportunities to exceed, succeed? Uh, Sherry, I, I, that was actually in, in regard to uh, orientation course. So the 11 day orient, it's a credit, no credit, um, I'm not even credit, no credit. It's just the orientation they have, course they have to take if they have zero um, credits coming into classroom. They're not talking about like other, other classes. Um, and then I really like the last bullet point. Do I give my students a voice? If a student comes and speaks to us and says, hey, you know what, I'm struggling with this. What, are, what is it that we're saying back to them? Are we allowing them to have that, that space and that opportunity to, to, to share those, those uh, vulnerabilities with us? To unmute myself. So our next reflective question before we move on to the next um, theory is how aware am I of my students unique cultural strengths and how do I use this information to promote student achievement. So again 30 seconds to kind of think about that contextualize it for yourself your facilitation in the classroom. How aware are you of your students' unique cultural strengths? And how do you use that information to promote student achievement? So Debbie did mention as we were going through this that a lot of these um, theories or approaches as we discuss them sound the same. And um, it's right because she ended with, do we give our students a voice? And that's kind of the same 
concept as we look at what culturally responsive instruction is. So culturally responsive instruction, what it's not, it's not a bag of tricks. It's not a simplistic solution or a quick fix as we look in the classroom. Um, our instructional decisions shouldn't be made based on stereotyped cultural decisions. Are we, you know, um, our stereotypes that Asians are, are all talented in math, so they're just going to knock it out of the park, so we're going to skip over a unit or, I mean, there are all kinds of cultural um, stereotypes that we can bring in there. An instructor does not have to be an expert of all cultures to be, um, to be culturally responsive in the classroom. And it's not an engagement strategy to motivate at-risk students um, per se. So as we think about that in our actions in there, I see that Karen mentions that we do talk about cultural diversity and competency in a lot of our classes and have had some interesting student comments about their own culture, which is a conversation Debbie and I were having as we prepare this is sometimes in a five week course, um, it's hard to pull those things out of students. I'll get to that in a minute. So culturally responsive instruction and what it is, is it's a pedagogy with a foundation and reflection. It's a redefinition of that teacher student role. Um, when we think about it, you know, the majority of teachers in, in the United States are of middle class European American background. Um, and it's easy for teachers to think that they act in a race blind fashion, which, um, which is what, and Debbie gave a presentation yesterday on microaggression. So as we talk about race blind fashion, that could be actually a negative as we go through the classroom if you haven't had a chance, if you didn't attend her session and have an opportunity to watch the recording and then compare it to what we're looking for with culturally responsive instruction. It, it's kind of um, almost hard to differentiate between the two, how you can be culturally responsive without committing you know, some microaggressions um, or allowing that to happen in that conversation. So super valuable to look at those two things together. But these instructors, it's easy to, estimate, to overestimate your own knowledge of other cultures, um, which can then result in some cultural insensitivity as you go through the class. And so looking at that redefinition of teacher-student roles and giving students a voice um, really helps support the idea um, that everyone is on an equal playing field and that's important. And then identification of unique cultural strengths to promote academic success. So really allowing students to kind of establish and develop who they are and value their cultural identity as we go through. Um, it does mean reducing power in the classroom. So the differential between the instructor and the students, giving students um, the opportunity kind of walking away from that authoritarian type classroom where we may be perceived um, as kind of promoting a sense of social injustice. And so those are all things, you know, in, in today's global, social, political climate that we need to be almost hypersensitive to in the educational setting. So um, let's think about what we do. We can be culturally responsive in the classroom by being curious. So Karen mentioned that they have student that she has students talk about those things and have some interesting student comments about their own culture. How can we do that? How can we extrapolate that information from the students so that they feel comfortable sharing and and facilitate that conversation. We want to make sure that we don't fall back on assumptions. You know, we have a lot of communications when students do feel empowered to share their voice and we need to be responsive. Um, when they do question everything, you know, so it's not Oh, I've heard this and I see this and I know always always question what you know. Um, allow opportunities, of course, for students to collaborate with one another and to build that diverse um, communal orientation in the classroom. And so as you go through and are reflecting after, you know, maybe participating in the discussion board one evening or things like that, if you pull out this list of questions and, and ask yourself, how did I encourage students to ask questions today? How do I make students feel important? How did I show my students that I care today? What do I do that encourages students to do best work? And what did I do to motivate students to become active participants in their learning? Because if I can motivate them to become active participants in their learning, they're more likely to persevere. And so, um, you know, through, through being culturally responsive and promoting that idea, 
we can kind of hit on the other. So just some things to think about. And again, that overlap as you go through, you could ask yourself that question in relation to mindset, in relation to um, validation theory, um, all of those things. I definitely agree. And I, I was just thinking too about this concept of imposter syndrome. We have a lot of students who would come to us and they have that imposter syndrome. And, and I think all of this kind of helps weed through that. Let's move on to our next reflection. How aware am I of how my emotional responses impact my interactions in the classroom? So again, how aware am I of how my emotional responses impact my interactions in the classroom? So this next theory that we're going to talk about is actually, um, it's not an educational theory or approach um, per se, um, but it comes from uh, actually a research article that is very, very well known. It was um, uh, from Daniel Goleman in uh, Harvard Business Review, and he talks about emotional intelligence. And um, thank you, Karen. Yes, use emotional intelligence before responding, no matter how emotional you are. Absolutely. And so these are the top uh, five uh, uh, components of emotional intelligence um, uh, that he found at work and at leaders, uh, great leaders have um, high emotional intelligence, right? And in the classroom, that's what we are as faculty. We are the leader in the classroom. We're not, we're not the supervisor or the manager, but we might be the leader in the classroom. We, we, uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping a check on our emotional intelligence. So he looked at self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skill. These are all things we want our students to develop. We, want, we hope that they develop them you know, uh, throughout our, our interactions with them here at Ashford. But of course, we need to take on that responsibility for ourselves before we can expect our students to take on um, these particular um, emotional intelligence aspects. So uh, this, is a, this slide is actually pretty much from the article in Harvard Business Review. We have some definitions, and then we also have different hallmarks of the particular components. But the next slide is the one I want to focus on, if I can move it. There we go. There we go. Emotional intelligence in the classroom. So, you know, how many times have we, or have you felt that kind of irk when you get an email from a student and, uh, or you, you read a student's assignment and you say, oh gosh, they haven't, they didn't implement that that feedback that I gave them. Um, they are not listening to me or they're not, fill in the blank. And a lot of the times, the reason why we have that, that feeling is because we work with a lot of students, right? And it's, we forget sometimes that, uh, that when a student comes to us to email us for maybe the extension or maybe they didn't implement our feedback, there, could, there is a valid reason why that happens. There, there's a valid reason. They're not just trying to pull the wool over you and trying to get a few extra days out of you. They're not trying to manipulate you. There, there are um, there are valid reasons. And so the first thing we need to do is just be self-aware. Is, is the reason why we're feeling this way because maybe we're, we didn't give ourselves a few moments to really think from the perspective of the student? Um, so we need to make sure that we're, we're being aware of our own emotions. We're being aware of, uh, of our uh, classroom presence as well. And we need to be aware when we have things here, or, or this list right here, when we don't know the answer. We need to make sure that we reflect on what went well and what didn't go well. You know, I send out an email, gosh, you know what, I realized my tone wasn't correct. It wasn't really what I wanted to convey to the student. And then we need to be honest with our mistakes. So maybe you send out an email and you realize later, gosh, you know what, I was being super harsh. Maybe send out another one and say, you know, I really apologize. Being able to own our mistakes, not only does that make us feel better, but it also communicates to our students that we do care about them. We also need to make sure that we're self-regulating, right? We're taking, again, responsibility for our emotions. We're not placing blame on students. Gosh, you know, that's so frustrating. We're placing it back on them. We need to take ownership. And I'm looking at the time here, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. But emotion, uh, motivation, empathy, and social skills. Social skill as in 
our skills in this, the social realm. And of course, we're in an online classroom when we're in our, in our courses. So we need to make sure that we're keeping an eye on um, uh, our interactions within the classroom, but also within our larger professional community. So maybe it's within your college that you teach for, maybe it's in the program that you teach for, tapping into those instructional resources that are asking for feedback from your colleagues and from your, your deans. Um, that's also really important. And mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Mindfulness is too. So just kind of as a things up and what we're hoping we're, thank you, walking away with today is that, um, that we're thinking about the quality measures that Ashford wants to see instructors implementing in the classroom and that we're also considering instructional strategies and approaches that can help us elevate our practice. And so as you think about mindset validation theory, emotional, emotional intelligence, and culturally responsive instruction, which instructional strategy or approach will you use in the facilitation of your courses to improve your overall instructional quality? So this time we can share publicly, if anyone would like to, and I know we're right at the end of our time as we wrap this up, but hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to take something away that they will consider, you know, experimenting with in the classroom. So thank you.